On our panel today, we have our own Dr. Al Hamoumi from the Assistant Dean's Office. We have Dr. Robert Britty from the Geography Department. We have Dr. Singh from Social Wellbeing. And we have Dr. Scott Walker from Political Science. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay, good, good morning. Welcome to the seminar. Today we will talk about decolonization of the mind and technologies, one of the hot topics in the last 60 years. It started exactly in the 60s. Now we want alternatives to the Eurocentrism and ethnocentrism. That means idea developed outside the European mind. It's human beings only 200 years. What does that mean? That means first time we create a science that study this human being. That means a reflection on a human individual. Now that means it creates sociology, psychology, anthropology, and ethnology. This science is dealing with that human being. Now when they create this in the, eight, in the 18th century, the European, they have idea to create a new human being for the European civilization. And that's idea when they create, developed all the theoretical and research paradigm about a human being and spread it around the world. When we, personally, I was educated in the Western culture all my life. When I try to apply psychology, which my field, in Emirates, I failed. Because all this idea developed to answer the problems of the European culture. European societies. Now, anyone who wants to start, start with you, Robert, or Dr. Sin, or Dr. Scott, which one? When um, I started thinking about uh, this topic, I started thinking about um, the history that you were just referring to, that is, um, prior to the 16th century. And it's interesting to look at various um, formations, globally speaking, uh, prior to the 16th century. Um, when we compare, for example, the development of various groups of people uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, um, we know that at that point in history, development was fairly equal. Uh, you may even call it um, even development. Of course, there were differences and there were complexities that existed in various areas of the world, but we didn't see the kind of unevenness that we see today between different groups of people. So today what we have is an extreme form of unevenness, not only in terms of development, material development, but also in terms of uh, the levels socioeconomically speaking, of different people around the world. We are in a period in human history when we have more than enough technology, more than enough knowledge to bring everyone in the world up to the same level of development, that is, everyone has access to food, nutrition, healthcare, as well as uh, various cultural and um, socioeconomic levels. However, we don't see the same kind of development taking place globally that existed prior to the 16th century. So the question is why? Why has that happened at a period in human history when technologically we are advanced enough to put people on the moon or even Mars, uh, but we are unable to resolve some of the most basic human uh, problems that we face? The other question that um, I was thinking about is the idea that comes from the concept of diffusion or diffusionism following the 16th century. And this has to do with um, processes such as colonization, during which certain groups of people are, are elevated, and I believe that Dr. Singh might speak more on this, this idea of whiteness while other groups of people are viewed as subordinate. But here we see the following kind of straightforward propositions. First, that is that Europe um, is the one that naturally, and I underline that term, naturally progresses and modernizes. Two, 
non-Europe natural remains stagnant and traditional and unchanging. So this uh, differentiation between European and non-European. And third, the essential reason for progressive cultural evolution which we saw taking place in Europe has often been associated with forces or factors that are um, thought to be intellectual or spiritual, something which uh, non-Europeans did not possess in the way Europeans do. And lastly, that progress comes to non-Europeans only through diffusion, that is only through the appropriation of ideas from non from Europeans by non-Europeans. I don't like to think of a world in terms of, especially coming from my background, European peoples that they've spread around the world and somehow these, this technology, this uh, way of learning that they've imparted on us has made things so unequal. I know in today's world about half the people don't have access to internet. Well, others of us are obviously probably using the phone as we, as we speak, right? Um, so um, when I looked up this, I didn't exactly know what to say, but I did look up the book, uh, Decolonizing the Mind, which came out in the early 60s by a Kikuyu Kenyan gentleman, Kikuyu speaking of Nguji Watiango, and his idea was that the key, we've talked about colonization, we haven't talked that much about decolonization. His idea was that to decolonize, uh, you have to um, understand the role of language. And we have referred to that, that language is a thing that bestows not only uh, a discourse, but kind of bestows legitimacy. If you, don't, if you speak the right way, if you use the right words, these are the right words to understand the world, to you know, the words of rationality, uh, the words of correctness. So what you need to do, uh, according to this early argument, the 60s scholars, the 60s literature people, was all the peoples of Africa, the Hausa, the Kukuri, the, um, <clears throat> the Bele, whatever part of Africa you're from, you need to all communicate these ideas in English together. Okay, so first we learn English, then we have to spread this knowledge. And the later movement said, no, what we need to do is to master our own language and be proud of that. So when I get into later to my example, it's of New Zealand and the, the Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, how they decided the best way to counter this colonization, where now it's not really colonization anymore, it's more, it, it's not anti decolonization, it's de, um, uh, neo-colonization, because we're not really in a colonization period, now we're in period of neo-colonization, neo-colonialism. So how do you fight that neo-colonialism? By countering it, by creating your own, by, by taking ownership of this technology, by taking ownership of these um, uh, knowledge, words, that, that the West has imposed on them or has given to them. You, you take ownership, you don't, you don't go into a shell, you kind of like counter it with your own uh, technology. What I want to think about is how have people been constructed differently and why is knowledge never neutral? Yep. And in universities, we view knowledge as something which is impartial and I want to suggest that knowledge in itself has been colonized by particular types of writers, particular types of thinkers, and therefore other types of oppositional knowledge has been subjugated and marginalized. So I want us to think about how colonization has been embedded within particular types of university structures, particularly in European yeah. contexts, and how that process has led to the marginalization of particular types of voices. And I think that's very, very important because I think we need to think about who's absent, yeah? What's absent on the curricula? When it comes to our reading list, you know, what authors are we putting out there, yeah? And which authors are we pushing aside? I want us to think about here the white mythical norm how whiteness has been constructed as the norm and anything which is not white has been constructed differently and how whiteness has become the reference point for particular types of judgments to be made. I want us to think about what's been erased within the university, within the academy 
and what knowledge has been left? And why is that knowledge possibly a residue of the totality of knowledge which may be out there, which we may need to refer to and think about? So my starting point is that knowledge is not neutral. Yeah? That particular types of knowledge has been put to the forefront and other types of oppositional knowledge, which may come from a different type of cultural context, has been marginalised. So I want to think about positionality, and I want to think about the processes linked to colonisation of subjugation. Subjugation mean, meaning suppressed types of knowledge, oppositional types of knowledge. So I think that would be my starting point, Dr. Mahan. <laughs> now, to do this is a huge problem, particularly for the culture. Now, how to advance scientific knowledge? Now, we come back to critical realism. That means to pave the way to science, technology, to get inside the mind of the outside the Eurocentrism. I'm just going to go back a bit to critical realism and the work of Roy Baskar. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things he emphasized is the relationship between objective and subjective factors. Uh, the way Bhaskar uh, explains it is the objective world itself is extremely complex. I mean, it's impossible for us to even understand 1% uh, of the objective world uh, given all of our attempts at research or what have you. So. What takes place objectively is always filtered by the subject. Objectively speaking, the world is more complicated than we uh, think it to be. So through the colonial period, during the colonial period, and especially in its uh, early forms, it was actually the Europeans who had greater access to the Americas and were first able to acquire the wealth uh, initially through um, you know the mining of things like gold and silver as well as um, initially through the uh, production of various uh, resources through um, new agricultural techniques and so on but as a result of acquiring uh, the wealth as a result of appropriating um, resources from different regions of the world, they were actually able to ultimately produce the knowledge that they saw most fitting. So here now knowledge becomes deeply entwined with particular kind of socialist relations. That is the, the rise of capitalism, uh, globally speaking, initially in Europe and then later to various parts of the world. But you see what happened with uh, Heraclitus, because, uh, you know, critical re realism revived the work of Heraclitus, in which he said, we, we can't step in the river twice. Now we have the flow, the change is coming everywhere. We, you want it, you don't want it. But the biggest problem here, the flow of technology, the flow of epistemology, the flow of science, like a river. Now the biggest problem is the structure of the river. And this is the key issue. That means you have all this technology, you have all this knowledge, free for everyone. Okay? But how the structure of the river, that means the structure of society, to handle all this flow of technologies. The people are using cell phone technology, but they have no idea about it. How to use it? Because the structure, the cultural structure, social structures, name it which hinder the development of the human being. I think this is the, the key issue. And I, th I think the point in terms of um, Baskas' works is very, very important. And I think Baskas' works are very helpful in understanding how structures, even if we are not aware of them, yeah. will still shape, shape. experience yeah. and will still influence the opportunities which we are exposed to. So I think Baskas work is very very important for understanding the whole conceptualization around what it means to be conscious and how we develop a conscientiousization 
within these arenas of critical thought and critical thinking. So I think that's very, very important. And it's not just peculiar to the United Kingdom. Those same processes are also being played out in the United States, yep? where black people, yep, irrespective of their social class and wealth, will experience social reality and social structures very, very differently because of the white mythical norm. Because irrespective of how successful you are, you're still being judged against a white mythical norm. So I want us to reflect upon that. But I think knowledge construction and creation is very, very important here. But we come into a predetermined world. Yep. And what's it mean to be born into a particular type of experience which may be shaped by historical processes linked to colonization? Whether you're uh, from UK or Egypt or India or Mexico, you're using terminology that was mostly created by Americans and other Nor and Northern Europeans, French, British. Um, and so what ends up happening is even if you're not from that place, you don't even come from that culture, you're imparting that knowledge that comes out of that knowledge, comes out of that terminology. So, um, for instance, in my discipline, uh, political science, and similar things, uh, economics, we have concepts like development in a, a developed country, which was mentioned, okay? What does it mean to be developed? Um, does that mean a high level of economic welfare, high level of uh, social well-being? There are lots of places like ancient China, Persia, Sudan, Ethiopia, places that are very old, have lots of culture that I wouldn't call undeveloped, but they, in the Western terminology, that's what they are. Um, we used to have, when I was a kid, uh, I don't know if you had the same, but growing up in America, we had the terms first and third world. You talk about a biased sort of terminology. Um, first world, people have everything, third world, and people who don't have anything and don't really know how to get it yet, or they're just trying to figure out. So guess who's going to have to help them out, the first uh, the first world. So um, we have concepts that even we can't get our heads around in in the West, like America calls itself a democracy. Well, that's a very laden term. America is not a democracy; it's a republic. So when you say democracy, you're actually talking about things like tolerance. You're talking about uh, that people have a say. You're talking about free institutions like media, things like that. You're not really talking necessarily about strictly democracy. So saying to another country, you should be democratic or teaching about that concept of democracy, or the word liberal. I mean, there are so many con conceptions of the word liberal. Um, in, in, I teach international relations, and we have a liberal form in international relations. That's nothing like what it means to be a liberal in, in a domestic political sense. So when we teach these to others in a Middle Eastern context, for instance, it's um, how can we really just lay out a term like that without breaking it down and decontextualizing it and saying, look, these are laden terms that we're teaching. It's interesting because uh, when the Soviet Union broke up, they hadn't taught political science. They taught economics or sociology or, or you know, materialism, dialectical materialism. And then when the, when the wall fell down, they all rushed across the border to go study political science in the West. In China, which had also no history of political science whatsoever, uh, when they first started getting uh, political science in their schools, they imported American textbooks. Uh, you would think maybe China with a very different history would have had some Chinese writers. In fact, they just couldn't wait to go to Hill and Knowlton and McGraw Hill and bring in the um, American textbooks, right? But, but, but the point is that knowledge has different types of epi epistemic value. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Some knowledge is yeah. privileged, other knowledge is subjugated. And I think um, the work of Baudoir is very important here in terms of committed scholarship. And committed scholarship from Baudoir's perspective is about creating oppositional knowledge and taking sides, as academics taking sides. And I want to go back to the work of Howard Becker, 1967, seminal paper, Whose Side Are We On as Social Scientists? Yep. And all of us around here are social scientists. And Becker's questions were a very simple one. Yep. Are you on the side of those who are oppressed? Or are you on the side of those who seek to colonize yep, and take ownership over the production of particular types of knowledge? And that goes back to a question in terms of what are universities for? What are the humanities and social sciences for? Yep? And how do they create different types of knowledge which may be critical of 
particular types of experiences and how those experiences may are structured within particular types of contexts. So I think for yeah. me, maybe the construction of knowledge is viewed very, very different yeah. from the lens which, which I use to see and read yeah. the world from. And this brings us to the core of this issue, is the social relations. This is the core. Now what happened? The colonized, the colonizer. The slave, the master. The slave, now free. But they are not emancipated. Yes. Why? Because the social relation of slavery is there. Yes. The colonized, the colonized. People are now, since the 60s, everyone, every country the is free. May be broken, but, but the, the, mind. The, yes. the social relation of colonization is there epistemologically, culturally, socially, and even self. Some people, they defeat themselves. Like this quote from uh, Franz Fanon, he said, the colonized will always believe the worst about themselves. And that's what is going on. Yes. So internalization. Yeah, uh, through this process to... of internalization. Now, what do we, we do need the freedom, emancipation. Yes. And that's really the core of the social sciences. Yes, emancipate yeah. the mind. Emancipate the mind. That's very interesting, thank you. Um, so you're almost raising the issue of the class interest of particular kind of epistemologies. You know, what is the class interest behind a particular kind of epistemology? Um, if we're talking about colonized and colonizer, or slave, master. slave owner, or master, uh, those are clearly different classes. And it's clearly in the interest of one class to construct, if you like, uh, the subordinate in a particular kind of way to feed their own interest. And I think we see this during the slave movement. Uh, blacks had to be constructed in a particular way because they had to be subjugated beaten or killed, and if you saw them as an equal, their subjugation becomes much more difficult. Today, we continue along those kinds of lines, even globally. We accept the fact that some groups can live in dire poverty, while others can live in extreme, extreme wealth. But how do we do this unless we construct those groups in a particular kind of way? Okay, thank you so much to our faculty members. We have some certificates for each of you. So, Dr. Singh, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. Dr. Walker, thank you very much. And Dr. Britty, thank you. All right, this concludes our discussion on decolonizing the mind and technology for today. Um, thank you to our guests, and we hope to see you next week for our roundtable discussion on Angela Davis's autobiography. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.